Karan, welcome to South Asian Stories. Thank you. Thanks for pronouncing my name with the oomph that it deserves. I know. Well, you know, I'm sure you, you know, being in 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 Hollywood and and in many a variety of different peoples, like you must have gotten him pronounced, mispronounced in like all these different types of ways. Like, what's the worst pronunciation yeah. you've gotten? Like Karen? <laughs> or um, I think Quran is like Karen to me, I'm like, I see it, I guess. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah, Quran to yeah. me seems like where did the U come from? Like, I don't know. It just feels very <laughs> weird. But I grew up in India. And so for most, for the most part, I had never really had my name mispronounced uh, yeah. because it's a very, very common name. And I yeah. often tell white people that it's like, you know, if you grew up in America with the name like John or something, and then you just showed up in India and they were like, Johan. And you're like, what? I didn't even know that those words could sound like that. So, um, but like a while ago, I did um, this thing called the New York Film Academy. When I was like 19, I did like a acting for film, like summer program in New York, uh, just as an uh-huh. excuse to live in New York for a month. And um, there, like the professor at one of the classes was just like, I must pronounce it. And I was so exhausted at that point because I'd been in America for a year and I had gone through this with every freshman class where I just was like I don't want to do this anymore (laughs) like I just keep repeating it and people I was like no no and so I was like honestly I I'm it's whatever you want to say is fine and then um he just insisted and then finally this one girl was like oh it's just it's the word car and the word in Karin and I was like it's not but it's really close so yeah that's what I I literally did it five times this week with different people where I was just like car and in Karin and they're like yes okay yeah. that makes sense so now I feel like I say my name as Karin which is so bad because it's not yeah. it's cut in but like you know whatever um it's it's crazy to be like uh how many times in a day I have to do that to fix yeah it. Well, a similar story. So um, my, my wife, her name is Rachita. Uh-huh. Um, and at work, you know, sometimes oh. she goes by Rachita um, mm-hmm. or Rashida. And so um, with, this is one of my favorite stories is like I was at her work, like Christmas party. Uh-huh. And, and people, one, uh, I think one of her managers came up to me. He's like, oh, I love working with Rashida. And I'm like, oh, great. Who, who is that? <laughs> and they're like, your, your wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah yeah of course yeah, 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 she, yeah. she's amazing yeah. and then we get to talk like oh sometimes you know it's to, to your point where she's just like tired of correcting people and just like you know what yeah i'll just go with it with um, anything and, yeah yeah and Did, does she have like a, less... sorry does she have like a, a like a white name or more like american sounding name that she yeah, uses i mean like at starbucks she, or something she uses rachel quite a bit. rachel yeah uh, there we go yeah Mine's yeah, Kevin. It's Kevin, nice. And then when I'm really <laughs> bored, I'm like Keith. I don't know why. Yeah. It's so boring, but anyways. Yeah, people and, say Samir. They say Sam all the time, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know. But yeah. actually, the worst thing that's happened is so my last name is Desai, but um, I had a teacher in seventh grade that had me for the whole year, Karen, and then at, at some point at the end of the thing, she read my name and she's like Samir the Sani like the water brand. I'm like, oh, like, how, how did you get there? Like that is, oh. like, you, you, you know me, it's not like someone know, but like the Sani and Desai, like, yeah, it, it, Completely anyways, I feel every South Asian has a story like this that they, that they I think know. about. <laughs> so true. But okay. So you said you grew up in Delhi. Tell mm-hmm. us about your childhood. Like what, how, what was your family like? What was it like growing yeah. up in Delhi and how did you come to the U.S.? Yeah, it's, um, I grew up, yeah, in, uh, in New Delhi, like, my whole life, like, I lived, we lived in one neighborhood for, like, nine years, and then another neighborhood for nine years, and then I just uprooted and moved to LA, which was really crazy, um, but yeah, I grew up there, I got into, um, uh, we, we came to, we, well, I knew I was going to come to school, potentially, in the UK or America, because Indian high schools are very, very good, it's, like, the opposite of what it is here, where most 
high schools are quite bad, but the colleges are really good. Over there, the high schools are very good, but the colleges aren't great. So that's where a lot of Indian students will study abroad. Um, so that was pretty normalized. Like growing up, I'd seen a lot of people do that. And my dad had uh, always wanted to study in America. And he just, when he grew up, they didn't have the means to do that. So that was like a thing very early on. I remember him just sort of being like, you're gonna go study in like, or America or whatever. Um, so with that in mind, my parents put me in an international high school uh, for my basically last four years of school, so my high school years. Um, and that sort of we study an international IB program, which I think is common in America mm -hmm. not to that people do IB, but it basically just helps bridge, you know, uh, you to understand for universities to understand like what your grades actually mean. Um, and so I was always sort of doing that and and preparing to study abroad and then my dad works for John Deere um, which is its own thing he's like an engineer and it's such an American company but he makes tractor parts for John Deere in India oh, cool. which is really uh, crazy because <laughs> they come and get assembled here but a lot of them are made in Noida which is like a part of outside of Delhi yeah. and so he had been courted by them to come out here for a while to America to basically work for them and run their operation from here. And so he had always avoided it because he loves India and he just has, could not imagine moving in his fifties to like another country. And because it was John Deere, the options were like rural American places. <laughs> so it wasn't like moving to New York or something. So they just, my family didn't really want to do it. And then, so it just so happened that as I was going to college, they sort of start, my dad started feeling like the next step was to take that leap. And so my family ended up moving out here too, which all this is a very long way of saying I'm grateful because I wouldn't be able to be working here um, in Hollywood because uh, if you're an international person, you obviously need your visa expires a year after college. And the way you can get a visa for Hollywood or creative stuff is called an artist visa. I think it's, uh, I forget the number or letter of it or whatever, but basically yeah. in order to get it as a performer, you have to prove that you have like a steady job in that field. <laughs> yeah. And by steady, they mean like you're on a TV show, like as a main character. And you just can't, I mean, unless you're extremely lucky, that's not yeah. probably going to happen. And a lot of times, yeah. like, yeah. it was interesting at auditions, there was like a thing which said, is your client like have a US passport or citizen or not? Because it, sometimes they don't even want to see you because they don't want to like, like you and then be like, oh, shoot, like we can't make this work. So sure. anyways, I was grateful that they ended up moving and I was able to get a green card and work. But I was, uh, I was always meant to study abroad. And then I ended up coming to LA sort of randomly. I was, I was going to study business, which I did in the right at the beginning, and then potentially essentially go back home and help like work with my dad, which is a very Indian thing that the son mm -hmm. like takes over the family business. Yeah. Um, and so since I was like a little kid, my dad would take me to the factory and like I knew all the employees and like it was just, I put like as a kid, I put the first brick for like the factory building, or whatever. <laughs> like it was like, this is what you're doing, which was kind of yeah. nice because in a way my dad, my parents are very liberal for being like Indians, but they were very much like, my dad was like, I wish I could have studied in America. And he was, he started his business like pretty much right out of college and that's all he's done his whole life. And he was like, if I would go back, I would just enjoy those years as much as you could, because he's like, then you're going to be doing this job for life. And so I was like, right. okay. Right. So I showed up at USC, which was the school that was like the one I really, I really wanted to come to California, basically. So it was like the best California yeah. school I got into. And I showed up at USC and, and, um, and then that was sort of what brought me to the West Coast. But the plan was always to sort of study in yeah. America or... So tell us about um, was acting or performing always something in your psyche or was it something that you're like, um, I feel I want to explore this more when I get to USC? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it was never um, at all like something that I thought could be a, a real thing because um, I grew up mainly watching Bollywood. So I would say like 75% Bollywood and then 25% like big Hollywood movies like the Harry Potter or like or like any Tom Cruise movie, because mainly those were the ones that came out there. So like all big action stuff. And that just felt like that's like 
I think a lot of people feel this way, even who are American, who are not in Hollywood, which is that it's just like a magical place where like somehow these things are made and like, it's not real. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so I was like, this is just like, I don't even know, like so far away. So that was not even computing in my head that that's like a, a thing. And Bollywood is very, uh, it thrives on nepotism, which is interesting that it's being challenged now, but nepotism for the most part there is like, ingrained in the culture like people won't see a movie unless they know which family the actor is from and it's like such a big thing it's like so and so son or daughter and and so it felt so um exclusive that i was like there's this is not a real thing either because like i'm nobody's like son or whatever so how am i gonna ever be in in this so yeah, your, it was your resume is tractor trailers right exactly yeah <laughs> i was like is there a tractor biopic um and so <laughs> Anyways, I basically, so my brain basically just was like, this is never a thing. Plus I always thought I was gonna be doing this job, like working with my dad at this factory in like India. So I sort of um, fell into performing and stuff uh, when I went to this international school in Delhi, it was called a British Embassy School, um, which is like a whole podcast from like my experience in that school. Uh, but basically there was like an emphasis on arts um, which there wasn't in, in the Indian sort of schools I went to. And so I kind of fell into like a drama class because I, I, I was supposed to pick these subjects and I was doing badly in the science stuff. And then in the same time slot, there was like a theater class. And, and basically my advisor was like, just do this and your grade point average would be higher. So I sort of stumbled into this theater class, which was like 18 girls who all wanted to go to Bollywood and were like super enthusiastic. And it was me and these two stoner guys who basically were like bad at science. <laughs> and so we were just like the guys who were like in the corner. And basically yeah. the teacher would be like, who wants to volunteer to try this exercise? And all the girls would like shoot their hands up and like just take over. And the three of us were like, thank God we don't have to do anything. And literally the entire first year I was in that class, I think the only thing I did was once the teacher was like, hey, have you been gone up recently? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then she was like, no, I think you need to volunteer. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, your hand hasn't been yeah. raised. And like, all we did was this like exercise where she's like, we're gonna, you have to pretend to mind holding a suitcase and then we're gonna tell you the objects that are in it. Or you have to, you, based on how heavy you make it look, we're gonna guess what's in the suitcase. <laughs> That's literally all I did for one year. And then I did all the written assignments and everything. but. But it was like such a joke, but it was so much easier than like chemistry and bio and all these things that I was really struggling in. So I was like, okay, let me just like coast on buying this thing. And I was very shy. I, I was very overweight before I went to this high school. And then I went to a boarding school to lose weight. This is like a whole other story for six weeks. And then I basically came back like stick thin and I had no confidence because I didn't have like a lot of friends and I was like feeling weird and like this whole thing and so I got bullied like relentlessly and yeah. all of my bullies girlfriends were in this drama class so I was always terrified that if I did something they would go tell them and then they would have something to make fun of me about or whatever so I was really yeah. like on edge and not feeling it and then the end of the program was at the end of the two years you have to put on a play this is your sophomore year final exam and the play is recorded and sent to England where they give you the grade on it. And it's 50% of your grade for these two years. It's this program called IGCSC, uh, which is the British system is called the GCSC. So it's like there, it's like O and A level. So it's the O levels, uh, the international version. Okay. Anyways, so uh, the cast list for this play came out and I was given one of the leads and I didn't audition or do anything. And I literally went to the teacher and I was like, I don't want to do that. And she was like, I have three boys and 15, 16 girls. And this play has like nine male parts. She's like, I can't have all the guys playing like guard number one or guard number two or whatever. She's like, yeah. I need to have one of the men like play one of the male leads. And she's like, the other two guys are such big stoners. They can't even memorize like five words. So she was like, you are the one <laughs> who's gonna represent like the men in the class or whatever yeah and um because everyone else was like cross-dressing they're doing everything and so anyways I ended up getting this part and then I was like terrible in the rehearsal it was like a whole thing it was like the whole thing was a disaster and then she essentially called me out one day the teacher in the rehearsal because I thought the secret to acting was being off book 
uh, cause I was like very nerdy. So, so my whole thing was like, oh, I would be a good actor if I'm, I'm not looking at these pages and everyone was looking at the pages, which is what you're supposed to do in the rehearsal. Cause you're meant to like, you know, figure it out, whatever, be creative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I completely memorized this five act play in like a week and then was just robotically saying the lines. <laughs> and then exactly. And then basically she just called me out one day and said I was horrible. <laughs> she was trying to get any emotion out of me. It wasn't happening. And she started crying. Um, and then I was so like emotional. And then she was like, go, like, go from this place. I'm like, go from what place? Like, I was so confused. Like, what's happening? And then just because I had some emotion, you know, I was really mad. And so I started just saying the lines kind of angry and the character was kind of like that. She's like, yeah, just do everything like this. So I just yelled the entire show. Um, but it just oh because God. I was like this skinny kid and I played like a 50 year old man and it was just so ridiculous and it was a comedy. So it ended up getting a lot of laughs. Not that I ever had gotten laughs in my life or been funny or anything. And then the big thing is why I continued acting was we put up this play and the whole school had to come watch it. I'm just like yelling and every line and like just being completely ridiculous. And it got like a very good response. And then all those same people who used to bully me, they came to see the show because their girlfriends were in it and they had to because the whole school had to. And suddenly like over overnight, I experienced fame, which was that I was not bullied anymore. And everyone was like- big for you. Yeah, it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. So on, it was a Friday and we used to go to TGI Fridays in New Delhi, um, which was a big thing where all the cool kids went because it had just opened and I was never invited by these people. And so my classmates, and so I just very distinctly remember we did the play and then afterwards those bullies came up to me and they were like, you're, what are you doing after school? <laughs> I was like, what? And they're like, we're going to go to TGI Fridays. And so I remember getting invited to TGI Fridays and being like, wow, like, and just waiting for the other shoe to drop. And then that entire summer, everything, they never bullied me again. And then they would always be like, when's your next play? (laughs) So I was like, oh shit, I have to like keep doing this. And so I basically did it as a, as a survival coping mechanism throughout high school. Yeah. And then when I came to college, I didn't pursue it at all. And then a few weeks in, I remember just feeling very depressed. And so like my advisor at USC was like, oh, you're probably just feeling homesick. And I was like, no, LA is great. <laughs> USC is great. I love being here. Um, and I was like, I just don't like my classes. And then they were like, well, why don't you take a theater class as an elective? Because you did that in high school. And then I remember taking like a class there and right away feeling like so much happier, being creative and all that stuff. And then I just remember having like a great class and then at the end of it being like, oh fuck, like this is maybe more than a hobby and something that I need in a way. And I was like, how am I gonna navigate this now? Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, that's what got me into doing it in college. So that's that's amazing, Karen. Like, and one of the things I uh, the theme that I want to underscore, I'd like to hear your thoughts about is how you developed your own confidence and your voice, mm-hmm. um, and you know where you start unsure, you know, unsure about you know your talent, your, what you look like, how you're perceived by other people. Yeah. Yeah. Me. How did you develop that confidence and the sh- assuredness in yourself and your abilities over? Wayne yeah. or what's it like? Yeah, that's a really good question. I didn't do that for a long time because I felt very fraudulent <laughs> because I was just like, because I also got kept getting cast in comedy and I, because I was so shy and was so bullied, I didn't have any friends. So I didn't think I was funny or, or in any way or any of that stuff. So I was very socially, like I felt very behind because I made friends only my last two years of high school and then always felt like I was catching up and so I remember even then coming here to USC and you know it was interesting because American kids are so if you are interested for the most part in something creative like you've gone to theater camp and done like musicals (laughs) all this stuff and I was again like so behind like I didn't know anything and so I just remember like in the beginning I would just very sincerely try to do a scene and people would just start laughing (laughs) it was also because I had an accent and like it was just like everything was happening and so 
I just remember being like, what is happening? But in a weird way, that is like the secret to comedy is just not to try to be funny and to sincerely play the reality of the scene. And if the writing is good, you don't have to do anything. You're just a character that is sincerely like going through these motions. Um, And so I remember like that's when I sort of realized like my sophomore year, I was like, okay, if I just very sincerely try to just be like, how would I do this situation? Then I'm seeming to like work and get like a reaction and everything. And that's sort of how I sort of managed it in college. And then there was like a real like confidence issue when I got out into the real world because it's very competitive and I had a lot of anxiety about like, you know, auditioning and getting rejected and all of that stuff. And there wasn't really any sort of like switch or thing that happened one day where I was like, no, I'm confident. It was more just struggling than getting some success and then reflecting on the success and being like, oh, I was just relaxed and like, I did my thing and it worked and people liked it. And so just trust in that. And I still to this date have to keep telling myself that um, over and over again. Yeah, because you'll get in different situations where suddenly you're like, oh, I'm opposite this huge actor or something in a scene. And I'm like, I'm a fraud, like this is crazy. And then you just have to constantly just start to be like, that's all noise. And just focus on what is in front of you, which is like, how am I, who is this character? What am I gonna do? Like, how am I gonna do it? And then anytime I am able to do that, it really, really helps because I find that it always like seems to work, but it yeah. is constantly having to remind yourself of it too. Right. It's like so much of our life, we're fighting with our own head, right? Mm-hmm. Fighting with our own insecurities and um, doubts with yourself. And and, yeah. so, and, and and no matter what position or what job you're in, I've talked to so many people, everyone struggles with it. Even yeah. the people that you think, are like the most accomplished, have the most degrees, have just done everything. They still have moments of weakness. And yeah, you think like, okay, I'm not the only one who who goes through this. Yeah, I think it's, it's weird when you're not nervous or anxious. And I think being nervous or anxious is actually a strength because our anxiety is ingrained in us as animals that we are in the real world. Like if we're out somewhere and we feel like, I don't feel safe, that's like a good anxiety because something could be off. Like, you know, you're walking down a dark alley, whatever. It's your body's way of being like, okay, like something's off. What's really important, I think, is how you, one, not to let the anxiety overpower you. So it is just like any other thing. Like, if you're happy, you're happy. Don't let it be so happy that you jump off a building, right? So it's like the same thing. It's like, if you're anxious, like acknowledge that you're anxious. Don't be like, I'm anxious. No, no, don't be anxious because that's yeah, not going to yeah. help anything. Acknowledge that you're anxious and then try to repivot it into something productive. So like if I'm anxious, like there's like a big actor in the scene or whatever, like I just go like, okay, let me just look at my lines. Like, let me just reflect back on like the work I did to prepare. Like what is this, this character? And once you refocus that energy, which is really what it is, anxiety is like a nervousness is a kind of energy into what you're doing it actually can really help and yeah. I think benefit the situation. It's not, it's easier said than done, but I think like with anything, like not letting that emotion overpower you and kind of using it to your advantage is really good. Being nervous and performing, if you're able to channel it correctly, is the best <laughs> because you're at a heightened state, especially when you're improvising. And sometimes the funniest, most bizarre things will come out of your head your mouth because you are in a heightened state of like uh, you know what I mean yeah right nervous it's just not being so nervous that you literally can't speak anymore or like you're forget you know what I mean so it's it's always that balance of like trying to tap into it and use it to your advantage uh yeah but anytime I've tried to be like don't do this or don't feel like this in my head it never works for me so yeah yeah. that makes sense Mm -hmm. so tell us about um you know a, a time like you worked on some major movies and and, and, and productions where mm-hmm. you're across a big actor mm-hmm. like ryan reynolds or daniel radcliffe or you know uh-huh. who sometimes are you're your heroes growing up yeah. like, at least yeah, for yeah, me. yeah yeah tell us what the experience was like and like where did you have a pinch me moment and how did you manage through those those scenes yeah that's a good uh question yeah i think um with all those uh people you realize very quickly that they are also just like what we're talking like 
in the same boat. <laughs> they are nervous about what they are doing as well, no matter like how successful they are, especially when they care about the project. Um, there, the only time I felt like a big person is sort of like going through the motions is when they are doing a job just for money or, or they're not like as concerned about it. But when someone like cares about it, like I would say Ryan on Deadpool 1 when like, you know, his career was not in the best place and that movie doing well, like was really important to him. Like, and he had put like six years worth of work to like get it made and everything. Like to me that he was the hardest working person on that movie. And so it was just one of those things where you're like, all of that sort of goes away like quickly because you realize like, oh, I need to also work really hard and do a good job and like, you know, it's just because you see someone else like being so dedicated. So there is always a moment of like, you know, again, that same thing of like, I'm a fraud, like this is crazy. But then yeah. it's really important to sort of just be like, okay, you're here for a reason and you're here now. So what are you going to do with this opportunity? Like, are you going to make the most of it? Or are you just going to like hit yourself over the head and like, you know, just punish yourself for, I don't know what. So yeah. um, yeah. it's always, it does like happen that moment, but I, it, I think it, it does really help to see these people that you've put on all this stuff on to just also like, in the waiting room like just running their lines and being like do you want to run this scene like I don't think I know these lines and you're like yeah yeah, yeah let's do it um and then that can be really fun because it's really exciting to be creating something on a set with the other people also excited to make something it's the worst when you're working on something and there's a general sense that the project isn't that good or people are just doing it for money and you're sort of just like I guess let's do this <laughs> it's it's really yeah. It's really cool when uh, someone that you've looked up to is also like, oh my God, like this is so exciting. Like this is such a good scene or, you know what I mean? And then it, th that infectious energy can be really, really fun. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. And like, you know, being South Asian, like this is the type of world that we just don't have much exposure to because mm -hmm. there's so many, like we have so many lack of mentors who've done this, who've broken mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Was that tough for you? Like not seeing people that looked and sounded like you and, and you're basically forging your own path. Yeah, it was really, it was really tough. Well, going back to like way in the beginning, um, I, at the end of my freshman year, or sorry, end of, close to the end of my sophomore year at USC, I had to declare a major. And I really, really, at that point was like, I wanted to film my art, art theater major. And I was just obsessed with like being in those classes and I used up all my electives. So basically I had to declare a major and if I didn't pick one of those, I could not take another theater or film class for two more years. And, and so I had to like sit down with my family and basically be like, I really, really want to try this. And my, my family had basically been like, you know, they're very supportive and, and liberal for Indian parents, like I said, but even they were like, what is like, how are you gonna, because they couldn't even, you know, point to someone to be like oh you could be like this person or whatever yeah because there was literally no one I remember my uh, freshman or sophomore year at USC like walking through the quad and seeing a poster of Aziz like hosting the MTV movie awards or something and I literally was like who is that like how can he be on that like it was shocking to me like I stared at it yeah. for a long time because I was like that's yeah. the host like who is that and so it was just so rare and I couldn't even you know name five people that were doing it so um, that was definitely, you know, all of it was really scary because it was just like jumping into it. But I remember very, very early on and for a long time um, having this feeling like my skin wasn't brown enough. <laughs> Why I had this thing where I was like, I'm getting rejected because I'm not South Indian looking because yeah, right, that right. looked more Indian. Because sometimes people were like, hmm, you look like you could be mixed. And to me, I would Persian, absorb, yeah. yeah, I would absorb that as like, oh my God, that's horrible. So I would literally go out and stand in the sun before an audition <laughs> for hours and get darker and be like, if I don't look like I fit this box enough, they'll be like, there's yeah. someone more Indian looking because the roles had such few lines that like, it really wasn't about your ability. It was more like, they're like, we have an Indian character like here or whatever. And I used to think that I wasn't working because I wasn't South Indian looking because there was like a mix of people and there were a lot of South Indian looking actors who were just darker skinned and I was like oh my god damn it like this is the reason yeah and now I think back and I'm like god that's really sad that that's like what I used to be so like anxious and upset about but 
I feel very lucky to be working at a time where the change has been very rapid and yeah. I've noticed even in the last five years, like there just is more interest in, you know, other people. Um, I still think it's like not there yet a hundred percent, but obviously, but it feels like I feel very, very grateful to be there in this time period uh, because I I can only imagine like how, like for Calpen, like I heard him actually on the podcast, this uh, quarantine, and he was talking about how he went in for something and there was like a white person in brown face um, openly at the audition. And that's like traumatizing. I think like all that stuff having, if I'd had to go through that for like decades, um, is really traumatizing. And also just practically, it's not really a way to make a living because if you have a smaller role, you get paid quite little. Right. And so if the opportunity isn't there, you're basically living off of scraps and it's very hard to make a career, you know, like that. You have to be given a chance to try to be on a TV series or do something where you can actually make a living and you're not just, you know, you know, making 500 bucks a day every other month if you get a a line on a show or something. So, yeah, in every aspect, I feel like very lucky and um it is definitely <laughs> scary, but I will say I started when I was 20 years old. I got my first agent when I was in college. And I don't know about you, but I was just like completely blissfully ignorant <laughs> about everything. I was like, yeah, I'll do this. <laughs> when you yeah. now like, you know, I mean, I wasn't thinking about money, rent. Like I was like, wow, yeah. And it's only when we get Enjoy. older, we start putting like other things on it. Like I need to have savings. And you know, I wasn't thinking about any of that. I was just like, yeah happy or lucky like just being like yeah let's do this uh which i think is really important and it's good to have that but i was very blindly going into it um but yeah so you know what has karen surprised you and you started at 20 like happy go lucky as you said Mm -hmm. now it's been what five six years in the business no i'm uh, 12 years 12 years in the business yeah 32 now yeah what has surprised you? What have you learned the most um, that you that you can oh, share? Yeah. I think so many things. <laughs> um, one thing that I think the biggest thing I've sort of learned is that um, things are <laughs> like constantly going to be changing and you just have to adapt to it as best you can. Um, like, you know, when I started, it was uh, like in 2009, I want to say, um I got my first job and like you know no no like movie actors were doing tv there was no streaming there was like none of this stuff and it's all like changed and moved so quickly that I think like the biggest thing is to just not fight that change and just just chase good material wherever you can um I think is a big thing and then in terms of the thing of adapting and changing Uh, COVID is like a big part of it. And obviously I've worked on a few productions now during this time. It's not the best. (laughs) It's very weird feeling to like be surrounded by people in hazmat suits and like literally have this N95 mask on until like you lower it and then say a line. I mean, it's just completely crazy, but I'm so grateful for the people that came together to make it safe enough for us to work again, because it was terrifying for months to be like, oh, I'm in an industry that for the most part, cannot work from home. And like, what does that mean? Like, you know, like, is it really like obsolete? And to adapt to that and be like, okay, there's all these things, like right now I'm on a job and I get tested three times a week. It's just like crazy, like everything is completely different. And so to sort of just not fight it and be like, okay, how can I make the most and adapt to like the situation that is happening? And then for me personally, you know, when I got in, I had no interest in writing, directing, producing, any of I just loved performing and I was like this joy and like I want to do and it was one of the biggest lessons as I got into the industry I used to think that like I used to idolize like this lifestyle of successful actors and it was jarring to like work with someone um and then like I won't name someone but it's someone I grew up with and it was one of my first jobs. It was, they were in a kid's movie that I used to watch in India. And I was like in this thing with them. I was freaking out. And two years later, they were a waiter at a restaurant I went to. 
Um, and just two years before they were in the lead of this TV movie that I'd done. Anyways, it was one of those things where I was just like, oh my God, like I just couldn't wow. believe it. And so that was the thing. Interesting. I remember at one point I went on IMDb and it's a very sad game you can play, but you can take like someone you used to watch like on the show or something and then track like the years after and there's a credit every other year. And then you think, oh, that's like, maybe they worked a month in two years. Like that's really crazy to think. And so I slowly started piecing together, like, you have to be able to try to do as many different things as possible. Sure. Sure. Obviously, only do it if you have an interest in it, ideally, and are somewhat good at it, because you're not going to be successful otherwise, because it's such a competitive industry. But I really sort of was very narrow-minded and was like, this is all I want to do is perform. And then I very quickly was like, okay, like, ultimately, what I want to do is I want to be in this industry. Sure. More than anything, because I love this, like everything out of this industry, and so that led me to begin to write and direct and do other things that I was very closed off to before. Um, and I found a lot of like joy in those aspects of it too. And it ends up making every part of it better because sometimes when you're in a lull from an acting standpoint, you can, like this pandemic was perfect. Like when everything was shut down, like I was able to co-write a script and we were able to make this movie just as things started opening up. But otherwise for those three months, if I was just sitting at home, like I doing nothing, I don't even, for myself, I would have gone crazy and <laughs> it would have not been good. Um, so it's just one of those other things, which is just to be willing to change your plans. And adapt. Yeah, and I love what you said about diversifying, right? You said, I mm -hmm. wanna be in the industry. I don't need to be yeah. pegged as just an actor, right? Yeah. I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm a mm -hmm. producer. I do all these things, but I'm, I'm just, if one thing goes down for some reason, everything comes up and you feel balanced across the board. Yeah, there are, I think a lot of actors actually that I've worked with too that just wanna act and that's great. And they're very good at it. I think you have to mentally be prepared for the lulls in that case, sure. which yep. is you know your own coping mechanism. Cause I've worked with a bunch of actors who've tried to do other stuff and they've just not found joy in it. So, and I completely, I'm like, don't do it. Like that's completely fine. I feel very lucky that I realized like the other day I was reflecting and when I was growing up, I used to like buy Bollywood, you know, only listen to Bollywood soundtracks, first on cassette and then like CD. And I would write the plot of this movie that hadn't come out based on the songs and where the songs <laughs> would be like, I'll be like, this is the sad song. So this will be like in the end, like and all this stuff. And I was like so psychotic, but I, my mom was around me. I used to do this and like with my Star Wars action figures, I used to like make movies and do all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I've just always loved movies and TV shows. Like I've just loved it. And so yeah. somewhere like I gravitated towards this first because honestly, like not for any artistic reasons, but because it socially helped me <laughs> to like make sure. friends and, and feel accepted. And that's great and fine, but there was other parts of my creative thing that hadn't been used. And, and I felt, uh, you know, I feel lucky that I have that somewhere in here too, that uh, I'm able to do that. So that's, that's been another awesome. big thing is to kind of, yeah, adapt to all of that also. Um, Karin, I want, before we jump into our rapid fire questions, I want mm -hmm. to hear what are some of your highlights, that stories that come to mind that you just felt so good? Is it all a thing you did or a war show or something? What are some of the highlights you can share with oh, us? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Oh, man. Um, uh, I think one of the first highlights was um, when I got to quit my restaurant job. Um, yes. So yes. <laughs> I, um, after I graduated from college, I used to work at this Mexican restaurant and I was doing like guest spots and I had just done this movie, Safety Not Guaranteed. And it was really horrible time because that movie went to Sundance and did quite well. And Sundance is like a very industry heavy place. Like everyone in the industry goes and watches those movies. And I was still, you know, auditioning and that movie didn't pay enough for me to not have a part-time job. So I was working at this restaurant, which was close to a lot of like Hollywood agencies and stuff. And so all these agents and people used to come in and recognize me from that movie and then have that moment of like, oh, like you're serving guac, like at this restaurant. And it was <laughs> just horrible. Like, and, and plus I was so bad at that job, um, the restaurant job. So I just remember for like, it took me a year and like a half ish to get a pilot then I was like okay I think I can quit because who knows if this pilot goes but it's enough money for like six months to like you know not work or whatever 
And um, then remember that pilot went, it was this show for Am the Amazon did like their first show called Beta. So it was, we did like 13 episodes or something like that. And it was like steady work for six months. And Good. I remember it was like the first time I was on the billboard, like all this stuff, but I just remember it really felt like I had made it because I didn't have to go to this restaurant. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, another huge, huge highlight was I got to work with Jennifer Aniston once on this movie Office Christmas Party and Friends was like the only show I really was allowed to watch for years because my family liked watching it too. So that was like a very, very big, like, oh my God. And we shot in Atlanta and my family lives in Georgia. so they came to, got to visit the sad and like meet her and like meet the rest oh, of the wow. cast so it's always cool when I can make them proud because you know I just feel like I would clearly not be here without any of their support so that was cool and then you brought up Daniel Radcliffe who was working with him um the first time uh we met on the show that we do together because Harry Potter was like another really really it's always anything related to my childhood because I grew up so far sure. from here that I'm like how did <laughs> happen uh but with harry potter yeah. those were like the first books that i really read for fun and i was yeah. just completely obsessed and when they daniel and i are the same age so when they were casting the movies i was aware that these movies are in cast and at the time i used to have glasses that were like the round ones like he has on the book cover and i genuinely believed for months that i would play harry potter <laughs> because i had these glasses it's so weird like i never was acting or doing anything but I was like oh I have the glasses and I love Harry this Potter so I was I just used to think they would find me and I didn't voice this to anyone or anything in my head I thought just over and over and then one day I remember seeing Daniel's picture and the rest of the cast and it was announced in the newspaper that they were like playing the parts and I was so mad and upset quietly for like a week and everyone's like what's going on with this like moody kid yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's because yeah. I was like I was snubbed um, and so to then, you know, be like years later, like friends and working together on this thing. And then on that one, I normally don't do any of this, but I literally was just, and he's so open about it, but I was like, I have a lot of questions. And so <laughs> I would rewatch the movies on a Sunday and then on Monday at work, I would just be like, how did you film this? How did that happen? What's the story behind this movie? And he would just very graciously. It must have been a thrill for you. Oh my God. It was a thrill. It was, a, and then he would show me his text chain with like, um with Ron and Hermione Emma and Rupert and like all of these stuff and these behind the scenes photos and these fun facts and I was just loving it and so oh, by season sure. two it was I stopped asking these questions because I got it out of my system but that was like a really crazy exciting thing to be like um how it's just a weird moment of like how did I end up in this situation yeah that that, that that's incredible like yeah. and it's honestly what you said about like you know, we owe so much to the, our parents and like, mm -hmm. you know, how sometimes you're just lucky to be in a situation that allows you to flourish in, in where yes. you are. And, and so many South Asians, like I, I talked to want to do these fields that are like mm -hmm. outside the grain, but they just don't have, as I mentioned for the mentors or the yes. support to do that. And yeah. this is why like voices like yourself are so important in our community, because if, if it's like, oh, look, and just as like you saw Aziz on that phone, you're like, oh, wow, mm -hmm. I, I could do that. People see you in on the screen and they're like, wow, I can do that too. Like, yeah. That, I, that's I, so yeah. valuable. I feel I could not do it. I would not have done any of my, what I did if I didn't have, both my parents were like completely supportive, which is crazy for Indian yeah. parents. But I think it's mainly comes from my dad because he um, worked a lot in America, you know, as part of working with John Deere. And so he traveled throughout his life uh, to come to like tractor conventions in Vegas. But still, I think it's the perspective of like traveling where you get to leave your world and go to another place. And yeah. I think it just expands your mind. And so I was, I'm just very grateful that they both um, have been so supportive because I cannot imagine them being mad at me because we have the Indian parent guilt, <laughs> which is real totally, um, and totally. being not supportive and constantly telling me to quit or do something else, which I know so many people go through um, where they have the pressure from their family to, you know, do the thing that they want them to do. If I had that, I think I wouldn't have, I would have just given For up. Sure. Uh, For sure. So yeah, my mom has listened to me like 
weep on the phone after not getting a job several times. <laughs> and and um, so now it's really cool anytime I can bring them to a set or, or anything. Um, yeah. And then one other really small, I just remember thinking my dad was, one of the really cool moment was I did a lot of like TV and other things like here in the beginning, but then when I did Deadpool, that was like the first thing that actually came out in India. And that was really cool because my dad was oh, working in India and he went to the movie theater and it was completely packed and he took like a picture. And that was a theater I used to like go to uh, when I was in oh, high school. Came full circle. That was really crazy because you're in this bubble here for so long that you don't really you know, pink. And so much of the stuff didn't really translate to going there or being successful there. And yeah. so that was like a one where I was like, oh my God, like that's really crazy. But wow, that must have been such a cool moment for your dad too. Like, yes, he son. was very, he was very <laughs> emotional about that. He was like, it was full. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> yeah, nice. nice. Yeah. Well, cool. Let, let me now jump to our rapid fire questions. Again, these yes. are questions we've asked all our guests and I'm yeah. so excited to hear your response. But the first question that I would love to hear, you mentioned your love for Bollywood and I'm sure yes. everyone listening, love, like a lot of listeners love Bollywood. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about your favorite movie growing up, favorite mm -hmm. actor and actress? Like, tell us oh, about yes. your Bollywood So club. easy. Oh my God. My favorite movie is called Hona Ho, but basically I was a sucker for any Karan Johar movie because yeah. I loved big production value. I did not like artsy movies. <laughs> I was like, I want my songs. I want my like everyone yeah. looking flawless. You want your Mahi Bay. <laughs> yes, exactly. So that one was like a really, really big one. I like wept in that movie. Like I just, I remember really loving that movie. Um, and so that was a big one. And Shark was always my favorite. And then Preeti Zinta very quickly became my favorite actress uh, for like a long, long time. Now my favorite actress is Alia Bhatt. I just think she's incredible. Um, and Ranveer is, I think, my favorite actor. But, um, but yeah, those were my, anything with Karan Johar was my favorite. I miss Have you, like those kind of Bollywood movies. I feel like nowadays they try yeah. so hard to be like a Hollywood movie Whoa. um yeah and it just it's just I just don't like them as much but the more artistic ones I think are really good and I'm always like wow these are really good but I yeah. miss like the commercial because the commercial movies now to me I could be wrong but they just seem like all like cop movies and like just really bad action and I want like family melodrama like that's what sure. I like like forbidden love like you know dream <laughs> sequence love song like, i don't yeah. want like Salman khan as a cop like beating up people like i just find that so boring but yeah yeah that's funny you want the original formula that worked right for so many years <laughs> yeah like a good family drama like that's yeah in in your experiences have you got a chance to meet any bollywood uh, actors oh yeah and oh yeah so i am randomly this is such a random way of how I got there but I've met Alia and a lot of people Varun Dhawan and Karan Johar and I have got a selfie together of us holding a cup of coffee uh, a la coffee with Karan um, yeah. because of this Hollywood director Paul Feig who directed Ghostbusters and Bridesmaids and all these like yeah. great movies but we had worked together on the show Other Space and then Ghostbusters and so we were good friends and Paul's wife is a huge Bollywood fan she had like a medical thing she went through and at the time she just randomly discovered a Bollywood movie while watching tv and like became mesmerized by them like later in life and she's watched more than me at this point and wow, she just wow. fangirled with the, the cast over uh, actors over twitter and eventually Paul started watching the movies and then tweeting at these actors and they recognized him and he then started DMing them. And so now when they come into LA, like he normally has like a dinner with them or something. And this was like a few years ago, they were doing a concert tour uh, that uh, Karin Johar was doing where he would MC mm -hmm. and then all these actors like Katrina Kaif, they would all come and dance. And they came to the forum in LA and Karin Johar had never met Paul and his wife and they, he got them VIP backstage passes and they were like do you want to go and I was like yes <laughs> so hell, hell yes. we sat like front row watch this ridiculous performance and then went and hung out backstage oh and my um the, my favorite most funniest I don't know if I'm supposed to say this memory but I'll just say it is 
Alia Bhatt and all these actors came in after and they had were starving because they hadn't eaten and they just danced for three hours. So they had their like little like snacks. And then they came into Karan's dressing room where we were. And Karan Johar was saying to all of them like, Pair chua. So they, he made them touch Paul's feet. <laughs> No and way. Paul had no idea like what was going on and he was like, like whoa, whoa. because in America like you know actors like movie stars are like oh my god like you've got to be nice to them as a director because if they agree to do your movie your movie will get made and so he was like starstruck by them and he was like whoa what's happening and he was like yeah yeah, like, oh, yeah it's like a sign of respect and he was like what yeah. is <laughs> but it was like imagine tom cruise like touching a director's feet or something oh, and you're just like gosh. something feels really off about this but it was yeah. such a bizarre like thing wow that must have been a huge moment for you to be like oh my I'm god in the, in the room with all these people it was crazy and the other thing was you know they were treating me because my accent is now like this in america but I can speak and understand Hindi completely. And I'm basically more Indian than, than here because I came out here when I was 18 and I'm 32 now. So I'm not even like, I'm spending more of my time in India. So they were talking to Hindi with each other and their uh, assistant slash the help, you know, cause they each had like five people. <laughs> like, they're like, chai leke and all this stuff. Like, at this, like in this thing. <laughs> they're traveling with like a huge entourage. And, it was so yeah. interesting to be like I they're presenting a version for this these two like Americans and me but like I also can completely right, understand right. like every little look that's being passed between everyone it was really interesting yep. I, I was like a spy almost I because you're almost like both worlds, right? Like you yeah. like you've made it in this Hollywood world, but your roots are in the in the yeah. you know, in Indian world. And so yeah. you can Yeah, and my code that. switching is such that when I'm in America, I only speak like this because I just have forced myself to for so long. And yeah. so even around them, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like lying because I'm talking like this, but <laughs> they probably think like I have no idea what they're saying or yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that's great. That's an awesome story. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Next question for you, Karan, is, um, is there an item that you bought recently that has dramatically improved your life, um, you know, big or small, service or not, just something that's just improved oh, yeah. your life? That you um, I bought a little Nespresso machine when the pandemic right. happened. So, yeah, um, sorry to Coffee Bean. I will not be giving you my money anymore. Um, but that was like a little... <laughs> little thing that i've used every day since yeah get your little coffee fix yeah on, on <laughs> for affordable coffee fix exactly <laughs> awesome that's great okay um when you think of a south asian person that you look up to whether in your field or outside of your field who would you say comes to mind and why oh that's a really good question um hmm, that's really good there's so many people now so i feel like i should Reflect on it. I, I really admire Mindy Kaling um, because I think she is the ultimate example of someone, of what I was trying to describe as someone who has adapted and sort of yeah. like created her own space in this place. And I think it's doubly hard if you're a woman. And I think it's doubly hard if you're not a white woman. And um, it's really kind of incredible because she started this also a few years before the industry was really ready to like champion it as well. And so I think like she to me is always sort of this person of like someone who's forged completely her own path. And yeah. um, at least from the outside to me, it feels like she has a lot of independence in this business, which is very hard because a lot of times you're waiting to be given the permission to do something, sure. Sure. which is very bizarre to be waited to give the permission to do your art or whatever, however you want to describe like your work. Um, and she, to me from the outside, at least feels like someone who's always sort of been like, I'm gonna do my own thing. And my other big thing is, I really believe in the power of something being commercial. Uh, because I grew up in India and because like you can do everything you want but unless like it's being seen by a certain amount of people it sort of feels like it's just happening in the dark um, so like you know that's why I think people being in studio movies or things and getting to like people around the world getting to see someone who's 
unlike what they're used to seeing really i think can actually make a difference in sure. many yeah. ways like yeah. with deadpool it's been like the biggest thing that i noticed one was that people in india like they messaged me still all the time and i was like the first movie was like that's such a small part i did not think that it would have any impact and yeah. it was really interesting to see how starved people were for representation in those kind of totally. bigger things i still cannot believe it and then the other thing I experienced, which is more American, is I work a lot of times in like not California, like I've worked once in Alabama, in Birmingham, right after the 2016 election. So in December of 2016, literally a week after the result came out, which was not the result I was thinking would happen when I accepted this job. And I genuinely was afraid at that time because I came to America in 2007 and Obama was elected in 2008. And that's the America that I was used to, which was totally like, oh my God, this is great. <laughs> like, you know, and then I was completely blindsided and was one of those people in 2016 who was like, wait, what? And then I was genuinely afraid. And it was really interesting going to a place like that where, you know, came coming from LA where literally everyone in Hollywood was mourning this election and then going there and everyone celebrating this yeah, <laughs> this result right. because they were happy yeah. and it was very bizarre and I was really scared but I have for myself noticed when I've worked in the south or any of these places that are quote unquote more red that I've like for the most part people have been kind and good but being in a movie like Deadpool has really made people nicer <laughs> in that thing because it's something they watched and then they're like, oh, I like that guy. And then they've wanted to get to know me or do something more. And I've, whatever little effect it has or big effect it has, I have noticed like it makes the person seem less foreign and like mm. a thing that's like out there that you should, you know, not know about. At least this is my simplistic view of what I've experienced. So I remember going to Alabama and being like terrified and I would get stopped by people and I'd be like, oh boy. And then they want to talk about Deadpool and how much they loved it. And they could get a picture. And they're like, you know, I have this Indian guy friend who I work with. And, and I'm just like, and they're like, he looks like you. And I'm like, that's really offensive, but sure. It's better than you saying like a hateful thing. So like, yeah. sure. Um, that's something, but I think, you know, the more th that is like normalized, it, it would only help, I think. And so all this to say that I think what Mindy has done is she's made things that are very commercial and have broad appeal and are watched not just by Indian people. Totally, and I think totally. that's really hard to do and also really powerful because, yes. you know, like Never Have Ever, the nearest thing, it's like a high school show that is watched by non-Indian people. And that's a huge deal to like have an Indian character with Indian stories, but also make it universal enough that like people are watching. It. And I think that is really cool uh, to be able to do that. Agreed, agreed. And, and one of the points that you made about the, you know, working in Alabama, the quotes that I come back to, Karen, is the fact that you can't hate people when they're up close, right? When mm -hmm. It's an abstraction of like, it's oh, really true. they're so far away, like I can, you know, I have these preconceived notions. But when you see people up, up close in your movie, and they meet you, they're like, oh, wait, you're way more similar than we, than we thought. And I, I, I feel closer to you. So that's yeah. why I think the representation is so important because people have preconceived notions of who we are as people. And then yeah. when you meet us, they're like, wait, we're not that different. It's true. And I think like I had a big reckoning with myself this summer with Black Lives Matter, where, you know, I yeah. grew up watching Black characters in films be negative, right? Because I watched stuff in India and I was not seeing any like good, like hero Black characters. Yeah. They were always thugs or drug dealers. And when I came to USC, I would be the kind of person who used to be like, oh, uh, like a little bit nervous because I didn't grow up with Black people. My only experience of Black people was what I saw in movies and shows. Right. Right. And it was not positive. And so yeah. I like had to, and obviously, you know, it's completely changed since then, but like, because LA is such a diverse place and I have Black friends and all this stuff. But I remember like when this was happening in the summer, just being like, I had that prejudice in me as a brown person because I wasn't exposed to anything yeah. else. And yeah. it's really, yeah, it's like a really problematic thing. And I will say sometimes I feel more judged in LA by certain people than I have in the South because, you know, sometimes people here can be very like classist or whatever you want to call it or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think they're, 
yeah, I think what you're saying is right, which is, you know, everything, I think all of this is coming out of a sense of fear. Right. And right. I think that can, you know, be, it can, it can be removed in a way or helped in a way by, yeah, by representation, which is like a big yes. thing. I also think there's a very tricky line though, because audiences are very sensitive to it when they feel like you're being preachy and shoving it <laughs> in their face. Um, yeah. And I think that that is not, it's, it's, it's this line you have to balance where I have noticed where there's content where they're like, this is pro this, that, this, and you lose track of the story or the fun of what you're making. I think like Deadpool is a great example where it's just like a fun movie and then it just totally. works because yeah. you're like, I love right. that character. I love this or that, you know what I mean? And then sometimes uh, these bigger projects can be like, here's the message of the movie. And I've noticed that audiences will just be like, no, like, I don't want you to, I never have ever is a great example. It's just fun. It's just like a fun high school show. And then it yeah. has that episode where she, you know, is confronting her Indian identity and all this, but it's done in such a fun way that you learn yeah. something and you learn something you didn't know about maybe something, but you're also laughing and having a good time. And ultimately, I think that's the power of comedy too, is can laugh, you almost are like, forget that you're maybe absorbing something a little bit more. Totally. Let me ask you this, Karin, that I just thought of, I want your perspective on, you know, you, when sometimes when um, actors, South Asian actors get into the industry, they play mainly South Asian roles, right? Or the mm -hmm. typecast in those type of roles. How is something that that you've been pushing against or is it something that you've embraced or what's your perspective on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. I will say in the beginning, and I think most actors will agree with me, not only South Asian, but any actor, you are not planning anything. <laughs> like you are just taking yeah. whatever job you will get because yeah. most likely you have three other part-time jobs, which you hate. And you just want to, in the beginning, my only goal was, can I just make money off of just doing this thing and not three other jobs. And so yeah. literally nothing <laughs> mattered. And really what that's saying is that you're in surrendering to whoever's creating the content. If they're creating the opportunity, you have the opportunity. Like when I did my TV show that gave me the chance to quit my restaurant job, the creators had written an Indian character who was a, one of the leads. So I was yeah. able to be in every episode and, but literally if they hadn't, I wouldn't you know, have that or whatever. So you're sort of very much at the mercy of that. When you start working a little bit more and you can finally get to choose, I think very few actors even get to that stage where they have that choice. Got it. So Got it. I feel for all South Asian or any actors who get flack for that stuff because it's not like they're like, hmm, what should I work on next? It's like, <laughs> yeah, what's yeah. out there? And I think with everything, That's it comes fair. to the people that have the power, right? I mean, we say that in every stage, I mean, that's why this election was so important because we can protest and do whatever we want as much as we want. The people that change the rules are the people in the Senate and the House and the people that we elect. We can't just do it ourselves. It's the same with this. It's like the studios who then start to green light movies, who then start to green light TV shows to the writers who are mainly white who want to write about their experiences because that's what they know. And when they write about an Indian person, they write about the one person they saw at a convenience store. You know what? It, what it's just like a whole system sure. that trickles sure. down and then uh, but anyways, when you do, I felt after Deadpool 1 that I finally had the chance to be a little bit more selective, Got which it. I feel very grateful for. Um, yeah. For me, it's never really, I never ever really think about that part of it. Like, does the character have an Indian name, American name, accent, whatever it is. To me, I only think about what is the character? Is there something fun for me to do in this job? Is got the it, character fun? Like people have asked me like, oh, and Deadpool, like you have an accent, do you mind? I was like, I was dying to do an accent in a movie because that's how I spoke for most of my yeah. life. I don't speak like this. And I would be like, this is someone I grew up with. That character is like someone I went to high school with, like what I modeled it off. And I was dying as an actor, you're dying to be like, I observed this person. I want to not play like a version of that or something. And that was something I grew up with. To me, when I read, I had auditioned for other things, the accents and not gotten it or, or not auditioned for it because the writing was dependent on that accent being the whole joke, uh, right? Uh, that's okay. where you're like, that's lazy. With that character, at least when I read the script for Deadpool, I felt like this is a really fun character. And so for me, it was like a chance to play a fun character that reminded me of someone I could use from my childhood that I could put into like, you know, playing in this movie. 
And it was right before the movie came out that I started worrying and I was like, was I just blinded by this? And am I gonna be destroyed by people for like doing this? And am I a horrible Indian person? And then luckily for the most part, I felt like people liked the character and, and I was like, okay, I just have to keep trusting that instinct. And sure, like anytime, you know, and you can play a character that doesn't have an accent and be more of a token and more of a person who's helping the story move forward and has no character. Cause I've played those parts too before when I had no choice because it all depends on the writing and what is your Got purpose it. in the story and do you get to perform? And I think it's very, my personal opinion, it's very limiting for an actor to be like, don't do that <laughs> because if it's part of your identity, it's like to me saying to like Reese Witherspoon, don't do a Southern accent because that's a hick character or whatever. It's like, she grew up in the South. She knows those people. She's gonna wanna embody a version of that. To me, it's more like, what is the character? What is the story? Do, is it moving forward in any way or is it something fun to play? Um, and if it's not, then I think you're in a tricky trouble situation, but that's that my sense. long-winded that answer sense. to that. But, well, that's great. So for Bopinder, you played in Deadpool. How much of it was the writing versus your own experiences? Was it? A combo or was it the like was it yeah so it was book? it was pretty writing the the what was really yeah it was really interesting about that script and when first of all it was like the best script i've still read to date um but the scenes the the it's pretty much all the first movie at least because i was so nervous to improvise it's pretty much all the scripted writing and some of those lines are so clever and so funny and i just remember reading it and laughing and being like this is hilarious because it was it was this very, to me, the way I looked at it was this very kind of unlikable character, which is Deadpool, who is horrible. Like he makes fun of people. He doesn't want to commit to anything. He kind of is just making a ruckus everywhere he goes. And to me, Deadpool has every chance. He comes across this fob who essentially is clueless, <laughs> just like living his life. And he has every chance to make fun of him, but he chooses not to make fun. And instead he gets very invested in his love life and gives him really bad advice on love. Yeah. Um, right to kidnap this guy who's his romantic rival and to me that really made me laugh but it also I loved the dynamic between the two of them because it was like it made Deadpool's character a little bit more human because you're like oh he's gonna just destroy this kid because he's like this mean like sarcastic kind of guy but instead he yeah. becomes like this really a, like horrible father figure and then especially even more in the second movie when he like mentors him or whatever and to me like that's what made me want to do it was the dynamic between the two people uh, and I see, I see. and how much I liked like this thing of like he just readily takes the advice some horrible advice from this person um but that's what attracted me to that one in particular um yeah. and that dynamic and I think especially I'm glad we got to make a second movie because you know, in the first one, they had just written the character and then we got to work together in the first movie. And then Ryan had always been like, oh, you know, this was so fun. It was just like two weeks or something. And he was like, you know, if we get to make a second one, like we will really kind of explode. So I'm like, sure, yeah, we'll see, whatever. And then in the second one, I remember he called me like right before we we're going to start shooting, before I was going to read the script. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to kill someone in this movie. <laughs> and I was like, cool. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be like bloody by the end. And you're going to, and oh, it was man. so fun to like go on that journey and, and like, you know, end up uh, in a way I killed the villain. <laughs> Maybe that principle in school because he's the ultimate villain. Um, yeah, but yeah. yeah, it was really, um, yeah, it was, that's what attracted me. That's, that that's cool. That's yeah. really cool to hear your inside scoop on that. Yeah. Thanks for sharing mm -hmm. that. Yeah, of course. Cool. Um, final questions. Um, what is a movie or book that has had the most impact on you? I know you mentioned a few, um, but is there any others that you can share? Um, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, the f uh, first com and comedy that movie that I watched the most and I watched the most as a kid, that was a Hollywood movie, was Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, that was like, I always wanted to meet with Robin Williams or even do like a one line with him or something. Um, so that was really bummed that um, I was never able to meet him, but that was like a big one for me. I just watched it over and over again for some reason. And then Jurassic Park, I watched a lot. <laughs> I mean, every other day I watched Jurassic Park. But the other answer that I'm skirting around because it's not um, as cool, but it's true, is the OC, the TV show. Because nice. <laughs> when I was in high school, the show was was out, but in India, we didn't get it on TV. So someone in my, this by this time I was in with the cool kids because I'd done that play. 
And yep. I yep. remember the summer I'd be started hanging out with them. They handed me the DVD box set for the first season because someone's parents had gone to America and got this DVD. And that's how everyone in our school had watched the OC. And we were just upset. We were like, is this high school? <laughs> it just felt like completely crazy. So this cool group was like, you got to watch this. Like, we listen to the music from the show. We like talk about it all the time. So I watched the first season and I was obsessed. And then some, I was very lost in my identity of like, who am I? And then one of the cool kids was like, you're like the Indian Seth Cohen. <laughs> I was like, cool. Like, that's cool. Like yeah. he's like, you know, the he. I love that character. And so yeah. I just became obsessed with that show. And then I had this very, my own cool moment where, you know, you have to imagine like, we've been watching these, these kids have been watching the same 24 episodes for like a year <laughs> waiting for new content because it's not available. And the second season had just dropped on DVD and my dad was coming to America for some work thing. And I was like, please, please can you buy it. And yeah, he bought it. Yeah, he bought it. And I remember like, it was unopened. It was still on the packaging. And I went to like the leader of the cool kids group who used to bully me the most. And I was like, I want you to watch this first. <laughs> you know, it's the first season like multiple times. And it was like, now you know what's coming next. And they all, all watched the second season. All this to say, I was obsessed with California and with the OC specifically, and was just like, what is this magical place? And so when I was applying to schools, California was never on my list because it's really far from India. <laughs> so most Indian kids go to the East Coast because yeah. you can, you know, maybe get a direct flight or whatever. But I only applied honestly to go to California because of the OC and I wouldn't nice. be here <laughs> if it wasn't for that show which is very dumb and non-intellectual story but it's the truth uh, no so, I love that because sometimes yeah. the like the, the the shows that most people you know really like they don't talk about because it's sure. like taboo or just but no this is the real thing and like that's, yeah. that's great and yeah. why you ended up in California and everything started yeah. <laughs> well it was really sad because cool. in the show I became obsessed with Adam Brody and then in, if you've watched the show you know his dream school is brown so I applied early to brown doesn't make any sense I don't know why I was like this is what I'm meant to do and got rejected and then got into USC and I was like still depressed about brown and then I was telling someone at USC the story and they're like, you know that Josh Schwartz, AKA the creator went to USC, right? And I was like, what? Whoa. I was like, there's no research on it. They're like, you know, they shot the show like at USC parts of it. I was like, what? Like completely cool. So, yeah, it's like fate that I'm here. <laughs> yeah, well, what's really crazy is that they went in the show, one of the characters goes, this is all boring OC info, but goes to Brown and they shot USC for Brown. <laughs> so oh. in a very crazy <laughs> way i made yeah. it to the brown of the oc so there's yeah that. yeah i love that yeah cool um karen so this is a, a very uh, important question that um mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people will will be um, very excited to hear your answer um what advice would you give an up-and-coming south asian person who wants to get into the performing arts or acting Mm -hmm. um, what advi specific advice would you give? Yeah, that's a good question. I do it just for any performer because I get asked this a lot. And so I haven't formulated answers specifically for someone South Asian, but I will just say for any performer, uh, the most important thing I think to do is to just perform as much as you can, wherever you can for free. Um, and I think that's true for most jobs you just keep doing it for free till someone's like, I'm going to pay you to do this and then yeah. you get paid. But I think with performing, the big thing is you just want to practice as much as you can um, because it's all a matter of, you know, at some point you will get a opportunity, whether it's quote unquote, a big break or whatever. And you just want to be prepared and ready to do it when it comes to you. And I think it's so hard now because if you were a comedy person, I'd be like, do improv shows or do this stuff, but it's so hard now with, you know, not being able to do it. But I would do like virtual acting class, anything that literally lets you perform and no job is beneath you or no gig, I think should be beneath yeah. you. Um, and then I would say, if you're an actor, just try to write something or make something just to see how it makes you feel. And if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. But mm -hmm. just try to discover early on if you have any interest, because I think what happens is acting is like the shiny thing, <laughs> the shiny thing that you're attracted mm -hmm. to because you're like, ooh, this, this life seems really good. And sometimes you forget to do the other stuff because writing is 
quite boring and depressing because you do it solitary and alone and you get notes and it's not glamorous and but in a way it can be very creative and very fulfilling in its own way um but i would say just try that out and if you feel like it feels false and doesn't feel good then you know you tried it and you can get it out of your system but it's good to keep that going at the same time i think too if you can uh, which is to write spec scripts to write like screenplay to do all that stuff uh, so my big advice is just to keep creating and then hopefully by the time you do get an opportunity you are prepared and ready i love that I love that. Wonderful. Wow. Well, well, this has just been such an incredible interview. Thank you, Karin, for your of candor course. and, your, and, your, and your, um, your input on so many things. Any final ask for the audience? Anything you'd like to leave them with before oh. we close? Um, I uh, get the vaccine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Get the vaccine when you, when you have a chance. Right? Yeah. So everyone can go back to normal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that's oh, my man. 2020 going to 2021. What else matters? <laughs> right, right. And, and where can people find you online if they want to learn more? And, uh, and yeah, it's, um, I don't really do Twitter anymore because I feel like it's evil, but um, Instagram I still have for whatever reason. Um, it's Karin Sony, I-T-S, Karin Sony is my Instagram. Perfect, cool. Well, thank you, Carl, awesome. so much. We really appreciate it. And, of course. Uh, and, and, and best of luck with everything as, as you go forward. Yeah, you too. Good luck with the snow. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Bye. Well, bye.